what to do before the judge. Any questions about that? Okay, I'm going to review it one more time. You go into court, anything that happens you don't like, all you do is I object. Why do you object? It's not my wish. I don't wish it to be that way. I don't wish that you make that motion or you, that you grant that motion. If he says that the best you can do, then you're, den- you're overruled. Say, well, for the record, I do object. Don't argue, nothing. Move on to the next point. The judge will love you for it. Okay? That, that's the professional way, the proper way to handle it. You don't argue in court. You just simply make your very simple statement, I object. Then when you get back to your paperwork, back to your typewriter, your word processor, you issue the order reversing whatever he did. Okay? That simple. Also, another thing is, when you're in, in, if, if you are being subject to their proceedings, their overrooting, one of the things that you can do is you can demand to be released. Okay? Now, whether he does it or not is another question, but you know, you want to be released from the jurisdiction. So that's the other thing you say in court, is that uh, I demand that I be released from the jurisdiction. Now, they may ignore you, but it's important that you make the demand. Okay? Because you put the judge now in a position of, well, maybe he's going to, he's breaking the law. He might know he's breaking the law by keeping you in jurisdiction. Okay? Okay, yes. Um, What if, from the get-go, they will not allow you to even speak? If they won't allow you to speak, just make that clear in court. In other words, you speak. And then he shuts you down. He says, say one more word, you'll be in contempt of court. You've heard that somewhere before, haven't you? Sure. Say one more word, you'll be in contempt of court. Okay, Your Honor. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. that's right but you know you, you say because now it's clear it's a railroad job right so not a problem because when you leave that court what are you going to do you're going to put it on the record with your orders and you don't even say object that one word well when he, if he says say one more word then you're out you say okay. just remain silent I mean you, that's he issued the order look he's got the guns all right? You know, remember, don't, don't, get, don't allow yourself to get into the mindset of, of doing battle with these people. It's just the other way around, with that one exception that you do object. Otherwise, you'd be cooperative. Whatever he wants. Okay, you know, say it with a smile. Okay, Your Honor. You know? No, you're, you're not here to commit suicide. Okay? That's not your purpose. You, this, this, should be a, this should be a friendly thing. You want to, you, you want to survive this process. And, uh, you know, there was... I've got to tell this little story, which is on here. It's, it's somewhere on that uh, website and CD. Everything that's on the website is on the CD. But on the website it says... Uh, there's a story about this uh, Buddhist monk. And... It was, uh, I think, a little after or during the Vietnam era. These uh, Buddhist monks were throwing kerosene on themselves and setting themselves on fire, burning to death. And that was a tremendous embarrassment to the government. Now, the government had a standard way. I think it was, uh, was it Thailand, I think, or one of those countries? Was it in Vietnam as well? But anyway, they, they had a standard way of dealing with problems. Okay, all they did was uh, whoever was causing the problem disappeared at midnight. Okay, that's all, no problem. But the, the Buddhist monks had a leader and it was clear that this leader was responsible for this. He was the one who was encouraging the monks to do these suicide missions. Okay, and he was a tremendous embarrassment and problem and yet he never disappeared. The, the rule didn't carry out with him. He didn't disappear at midnight. So it was quite a, a, a wonderment to a lot of people why it was that he was able to be such an embarrassment to the government and still survive. Well, there was a very simple answer to that. It turned out that this guy was absolutely loved 
by everyone, even his enemies. They didn't want to hurt him. <laughs> okay? They didn't want to hurt him at all. I mean, yeah, it is a pain, but, but they liked him. Well, there's an important principle here. Make your enemy love you. Okay? You go into court, you treat these guys nice. You say, hi, how are you? You, you, uh, you say hello to the clerks, you know. You talk about other friendly things, you know. Some people develop good friendships with the clerks. All right? They get to know you and you'd be surprised how they file stuff in that otherwise they might not. And, uh, they'll, uh, if you, you try to you try to make it a friendly atmosphere. I know the moment you turn your back on them, they're going to stab you. Okay? I mean, that's a given. But you still be friendly with them because it might turn out that the reason he's, he's a, uh, whoever it is is giving you a problem is because he may be forced to carry out some sort of policy that's unwritten. At least it's not available to us. Okay? Yeah. So... Um, if, if, he's, if he's doing that, uh, he, he's going to resist carrying out those policies to their fullest if he likes you, whoever that person may be. So, uh, there's, there's, you see, in every system, whether it's a legal system, a computer system, you know, business system, in every system, there's a hidden informal system behind it. And there's a lot of communication that goes on you know, you don't know. It might be that the clerk's uh, husband is a good friend of one of the judges. It happens. Okay? I knew a guy who was a mechanic. And somebody made the mistake of suing him. Like The person that sued him had no idea that this guy maintained all of the judges' BMWs and Mercedes. Okay? And he had informal conversations and one of the judges said, Ah, don't worry about that guy. Okay? Show up in court, but don't say anything. Okay? The guy showed up in court, and the judge took care of it. Looked very neutral. He had no idea that guy, the, whoever that plaintiff was, he had no idea that connection was there. I knew it because I was told. And, uh, but you see, the guy had a bogus case anyway. But what a difference it made if the judge knew you were a good guy and the other guys are bogus. You know? So there's more to law than just law. So I want you to understand this, is that you need to, you got to remember that in court, you gotta, you've got to um, develop these social relationships. Maybe you don't feel very sociable going in there, but you still got to do it. It's very, very important. The world, you know, many, many decisions are made out on the golf course. Okay, not in the meetings. This is, a, this is a fact of the business world and believe me, the court system is part of the business world. You don't know who drinks with who down at the, the corner pub. Okay? So, if you're one of the good guys and you're not somebody who's causing trouble but instead just simply trying to assert your, your rights and, and, uh, and don't be afraid to yield a point sometimes. Uh, for the, you know, lose the battle to win the war. That's okay too. You know, there, there was a Russian general that uh, used that technique against the French when they were invading Russia. And uh, his young lieutenants wanted to attack, but the strongest army in the world at that time was the French army. There's no way that Napoleon's army could be beaten. So what he did is he just burned all the land, you know, all the land, all the crops, everywhere. The only way that Napoleon could supply his troops with, with long supply lines all the way back to France. And as they went further or farther and farther into Russia, the lines got longer and more and more personnel had to be devoted to that, to the transport instead of to the, the business of fighting. And then, of course, there was a little guerrilla warfare in there where they'd harass the troops at night so they didn't get a good rest. And they, they, the French troops actually made it up to the edge of Moscow. Okay? And then winter came. <laughs> and they weren't equipped for that. And I'll tell you something, a lot of French soldiers stayed there, the ones that lived through the winter, stayed there, and many words in Russia now are French in origin. 
<laughs> okay? <laughs> so, uh, and it was all based on the idea of, of basically retreating, making it as tough for the enemy as possible, but retreating, retreating, and treating, and then the war was lost by Napoleon. Okay? Thought he was winning all those battles, but he actually lost the war. So, um, you, you, there, when you do your, your strategy, you've got to look at that. All right, let's, uh, let's go into the subject of sovereignty. If you're satisfied with, uh, everybody's satisfied with what to say in court, how to deal with the judge. Bill, okay. so you know that uh, counterclaim thing again? Okay, you want me to re explain the counterclaim? Just re okay. Uh, it, it basically. It, you, what I would do is I would do it anyway because, see, <laughs> ignorance, ignorance is everywhere. I mean, the attorneys don't know, the clerks don't know, the judges don't know the things that they should know. And so, um, you really should have a <laughs> counterclaim timely, but, hey, put it in anyway. What are they going to do? Throw it out? Well, then they'll have to explain themselves if they throw it out. Okay, and then, and basically you file your counterclaim. Uh, I think it's a little late to file your counterclaim after the judgment. Okay, but any time before then, uh, you could try it. Uh, I think in reality you should have your counterclaim in within a month after their claim reaches you, after you're served. Okay, and their claim's supposed to stop until they prove their jurisdiction prove that they had jurisdiction in your, your, your counterclaim. And one more thing, and that is that a counterclaim, the way you put it together, is identical to an original lawsuit. The only difference is, is that you, you've changed the name, counterclaim, and you're doing it on jurisdiction. The fact that you're challenging jurisdiction is what stops them. Okay. What if they have a trial in absentia? What if they have a trial in absentia? That should never occur. That should never occur. You should always show up for these things. Failure, you see, there's a rule in the court that basically says that if you fail to object, it means you agree. If you're not there to object, you're agreeing. That simple. Okay? They have a trial in absentia it's because they acquire jurisdiction. Once they get that in personam jurisdiction, they don't care if you show up or not. They say they care, but the truth is, is that the the trial will go on. You're stuck. I would never not appear. I always appear on everything. Okay? However, the conditions of my appearance are a little different. For example, you have a, if you have a counterclaim in, why am I there? Okay? The reason I'm there is because my, my court isn't open. Right on top of their court. And if they do anything to extend their jurisdiction, you object. Because they are misbehaving in front of your court. That's a contempt of court, by the way. And you can find them for contempt of court. Okay? We did it once. The fine was too high, though, and he never paid it. We fined him a dollar. Okay? But he never really got a chance to to pay it because the presiding judge yanked him off and they brought in a real top gun to deal with us who understood common law. So that's why we never enforced it. We would have enforced it if he had stayed. You have to understand what contempt of court is. Contempt of court only has two purposes. The first purpose is to preserve the dignity of the court and the second purpose is to preserve the authority of the court. Okay? When that judge got removed, he was no longer a threat to either the dignity or the authority of the court. Therefore, the uh, contempt issue became moot. No longer existed. That's why we didn't enforce it. Yes, sir? Uh, Bill, in uh, the case of, uh, I guess I'll call it the IRS tax court, which is in Washington, D.C., how do you the IRS, the, the IRS tax court is your court. You are the moving party in an IRS tax court, from what I understand. Even though they say it's administrative, you're the plaintiff and they are the defense, right? You've made the charge, whatever it is, and then they, 
the, the IRS representatives come in and represent you. Well, here's an interesting thing which I've never tested, but you've got to remember the definition of a court. It's, a su- it's the person and suit of the sovereign. If you open up IRS court and you are the sovereign of the court and this is your suit and then you label it a court of record, automatically it goes into common law, doesn't it? And if they don't object to that, it sticks. Okay? What's interesting is that in all the cases where we say, I'm one of the people and in this court of record complain of, you know, in all those instances, never has any of the opposition ever objected to that or challenged it. They just read right over it. They don't understand the significance of that. And once they've accepted it, it's there. Because in the following paperwork, and in every paperwork, I always say the same thing, one way or another. I don't say it directly, I say it indirectly. I say, I am so-and-so, a, uh, one of the people of whatever jurisdiction you're in, whether it's the state jurisdiction or the federal jurisdiction. And in this court of record, respond to, object to, whatever, okay? And they never, they never challenge that. So that means they accept the definitions, right? We have a lawsuit going right now where we actually laid it out. We put all the definitions. What's a court of record? It's proceeding according to common law. We, we even put the cases that, case law that, that supports that. Every single attorney came back quoting code. There's no code in the common law. There's a court of record. There's no code in the court of record. And you see, as the sovereign, when you set up your court, what you do is you, you, de- you decree what the law is in this case, the law of the case. You all know that if you appeal a case and you, f- and you failed to, to object to something or you failed to, to bring in whatever laws, codes, and so forth, the Court of Appeals isn't going to fill in the blanks for you. Right? They go on whatever you present. So, as a sovereign, you can decree what the law of the case is. Okay? Let me show you uh, in our example. Um, let's go to the example here. Right there. Okay? In this example, if we go down to the, uh, let's see, First Amendment action. First Amendment action exists because the original action wasn't any good. We tossed it out and replaced it with this one. Okay? But notice what it says. Paragraph 2, which normally, paragraph 2 would normally be paragraph 1 in a normal lawsuit or in a counterclaim. But this was the first amended action, so the first paragraph is de- t- devoted to explaining what the amendment was. Namely that uh, uh, the, the first amended action amends by entire substitution the action filed October 7th, 1998 in the above settled, uh, uh, entitled court. There. There, how's that? Can everybody read it? Okay, so then we go down to paragraph two. Here we go, you see the whole thing. Okay, so paragraph two, which normally is the first paragraph, says, William Jones, here and after plaintiff, is one of the people of California and in this court of record complains of and names the defendants. That's it. Okay, that establishes the forum, that establishes your sovereignty. And we'll get into that when we get into (coughs) deep into sovereignty as to why the people are sovereign. And we go down here to, further down, here's the the cause of actions, what was done. And now we have the law of the case. And the sovereign says, remember, if you're sovereign, you, you say what the law is. And I'll show you the case law that supports that. But take my word for it for the moment. The law of this case is further decreed. 
Okay, now the reason it's further decreed is because there had been some prior paperwork where the sovereign decreed the law. But here's where he decreed more laws in order to cover some problems that were popping up in the process. He says, if any claim, statement, fact, or portion in this action is held inapplicable or not valid, such decision does not affect the validity of any other portion of this action. That's now the law, because the sovereign so decreed it. The masculine gender includes the feminine and neuter. Okay? The present tense includes the past and future tenses, and the future the present, and the past the present. Now, this is, this is wording that you see all the time in the uh, codes, Right? This is where I got the wording from. So, um, but what I'm pointing out is that in the actual um, complaint or action, we are putting in what the law of this case is. And so it goes. Simplex dictum, that basically means uh, just, uh, the, we're just talking. Aren't you, aren't you, you had the California Vehicle Code. Aren't you mixing codes with common law? No. No. Good point. Excellent point. Let's go back here. California Vehicle Code. Yeah, I will. I will. Okay. The question is, we're using California Code here. Aren't, I mean, aren't we using it? Aren't we using code? We thought this was a common law court. Well... We are proceeding according to the common law. We're just proceeding. That's what a court of record does. It proceeds according to the common law. But the purpose of the court is to right the wrongs. Okay? Now, this whole case is, comes from the sovereign. The sovereign is the plaintiff. He's suing. The definition of a court is a person and suit of the sovereign. So, what, what the sovereign did was decree that this is the law. So, the authority comes from the sovereign, the words come from the vehicle code. That's why we're using, it appears we're using the code. It certainly fools the attorneys. So, the attorneys might quote another contradictory code somehow, but it doesn't mean anything in this court because he's not authorized to uh, decree what the law is. Only the sovereign decrees the law. The defendant does not decree the law either. Okay? So, that's an example in a, in a lawsuit where we decree what the law is. Okay? Okay, back to this. All right, let's get into the logical chain of, uh, uh, of points. Uh, yes. Uh huh. If we choose to use the habeas corpus, do you have uh, an example of that? How would how not would today? You? No, okay. but but the principles are all there because there's there's in in terms of form, basically. In practical terms, the only difference between a habeas corpus and a counterclaim and a regular claim, the only difference is you're not asking for damages. You're not claiming an injury. That's very important. Do not claim an injury in a habeas corpus. All court proceedings basically amount to a search for the injured party. That's basically what every court proceeding is. We're looking, somebody's making a claim, but we have to say, well, who is injured? Okay? In a habeas corpus proceeding, you're not claiming an injury. What you're doing is you're looking for the injured party, the corpus delicti. Okay? That's what you're looking for. If you say you are the injured party in a habeas corpus, you have now granted them jurisdiction. So you do not admit to any injury. You may be standing in front of the judge with a pool of blood around you, okay? And you are not injured. You are merely undergoing a reasonable inquisition in the search for the injured party. However, if they fail to locate the injured party, you then 
may be come may become the injured party because it was obviously an unjustified search and the techniques used were unjustified but you're never the injured party in a habeas corpus injured you know habeas corpus has been used a number of different ways uh, it hasn't always been used the way we think of it being used for example um, habeas corpus has been used to go out and pick up somebody we're looking for the injured party produce the body right well he's not in jail he's out on the street go get him so habeas corpus uh, was for I think it was about a hundred years it was used in that manner it rose up to popularity among the prosecutors and sheriffs and then it lost popularity because it was abused of course but that's it was used that way so habeas corpus can be a dangerous thing too but uh, basically don't talk about your injuries don't talk about whatever's done to you what you talk about is their lack of jurisdiction and where's the authority and don't give them any hints either don't tell them they didn't produce a, an injured party let them figure out they have to produce it later on you can make a ruling saying that it, that it, uh, they didn't produce the injured party yes Habeas corpus, that uh, interesting thing about a habeas corpus is that you can file it anywhere, in any court. And you can file multiple habeas corpuses. Uh, we did one for, you may know Al Thompson, okay? He, a habeas corpus was filed in the, as I understand it, in the United States District Court, which was the court that was chastening. It was filed in the appellate court. It was filed in the Supreme Court. It was filed in the State Superior Court, the State Appellate Court, and the State Supreme Court. There were six of them filed. I think it cost something like 50, 60 bucks for postage. And uh, hang on. So then um, um, that got him some results. That, that, that uh, shook the system. But anyway, yeah, okay, you had another question, if you're right with me. Yeah, uh, during Lincoln's time in the Civil War, I understand he didn't allow habeas corpus. Well, look, uh, war, when, once Congress gives authority to the president to conduct a war, then he has the discretion to conduct it any way he wants. He may have to answer later for what he did. So everybody, from what I, the legal literature that I've read, Everybody agreed that what Lincoln did was illegal when he withheld habeas corpus from everybody. But he did do it. I mean, that's power. Well, I mean, you know, when, they, when, when uh, somebody, when the robber has a gun in your face and says, give me your money, what do you do? Give him the money. That's right. So you see, you can't, you know, Lincoln had the, the physical power. So who's to stop him? They're all telling him it's wrong, but he did it anyway. And that isn't the first time because who was it... Um, I think it was Jefferson, and maybe it was also Lincoln. One of those two, I think, actually arrested a congressman because the congressman was politically opposed to him. Okay? Wrong? Illegal? Yeah, but who stopped him? Yes? No, is that all hit at the same time? Yeah. Okay? Now, in the Supreme Court, when you do a habeas corpus in the Supreme Court, they want to know why didn't you go to the uh, appellate court first, a lower court. So they want that explanation. But other than that, they're the same. Yes, you had a question over here. Somebody did. Okay. All right. So shall we get into sovereignty then? Now, is everybody satisfied? Last, last call for what to say in court. Okay. Then we'll get into uh, the sovereignty. All right, there's a chain of logic that you have to pay attention to.